Hello, rock fans out there. What's good? This is your rock fan, PJ Pat, who's going to keep you company. And oh, I can't forget my sidekick, Funny Fred Zed, right now, who's not looking so funny right now. Uh, he just had, I think, one too many joints, so he's just going to be chilling. Look at him. His eyes, his eyes aren't even moving, so uh, that's very unusual for him. Uh, he's just going to be chilling for the rest of the show, so don't mind him. We are so excited to bring you the latest interview with Ted Templeman in one of the recent issues of Guitar Player Magazine. And of course, those of you who know Ken Templeman discovered Van Halen and pretty much produced, I think, the four untouchable first albums of Van Halen. So looking forward to gathering his thoughts and uh, gonna give us a history of how Van Halen came about. So stay tuned. Obviously, Eddie Van Halen needs no introduction. If you are a rock guitar player or even a guitar player in general, you should know him and you should pretty much worship him. You all know him. I won't get into him. I'll just get into the interview. So interview is called On Fire from Guitar Player. Van Halen might not have been the same group without Ted Templeman, the producer who discovered and signed them, then produced their greatest albums. He tells Guitar Player how it all began with a friendly tip. Ted, these guys are hot. Article written by Ken Sharp. From his days as an artist with the 60s band Harper's Bazaar to his multi-platinum hit-making forays, Producing Van Halen, the Doobie Brothers, Aerosmith, Cheap Trick, and Montrose, Ted Templeman has always been content to let the music do the talking. But through all his many adventures, no one artist has had quite the impact that Van Halen did. In addition to signing the band to a contract with Warner Brothers Records, Templeman nurtured them through the making of their 1978 self-titled debut album and continued with the group through its most successful era. In the following interview, Templeman reflects on how he first heard Van Halen and what went down during the preparation and creation of their groundbreaking debut record, an album that introduced Eddie Van Halen to the world, and changed both guitar playing and hard rock. Damn right he did. Guitar player asks, Take us back to being invited to see Van Halen at the Starwood. What was your initial impression of the band? Marshall Burley told me about them. I knew Marshall for a long time. He's comedian Milton Burley's nephew, and he was kind of managing them. He said, Ted, these guys are hot. Why don't you just get out here and see them? So I went down there, went upstairs, so they wouldn't see me. I was watching Ed playing, and I thought, shit, I've never seen anything like this. I left. They didn't even know I was there. I called Warner Bros. chairman and CEO, Mo Austin, and I said, you've got to go with me tomorrow night to see them. We've got to sign these guys. So I took him with me the next night. We went into the dressing room and said, you've got a deal. And there were other labels turning him down. They got turned down at A&M. Gene Simmons had taken them on, and they couldn't get arrested. I told them that we've got to do a demo, so I went in and cut all their songs in one day. Me and engineer Don Landy. And we just went on from there. Bang! But the band, first of all, there was no guitar player who had ever played like that. God, I couldn't believe it. But also, Dave's lyrics were so creative. <laughs> he had a sense of humor and I never heard that unique situation where you have a heavy metal sounding band with a sense of humor. Think of a song like Ain't Talking About Love. Ain't talking about love. No, really. Please stop. My love is rotten to the core. No, really, please stop. You know you're semi good looking. And on the streets again. You're butchering this. Okay, back to Substance, the article. Thank you, finally. You said Ain't Talking About Love is your favorite track you worked on as a producer. Why? First of all, Ed's guitar. That riff is incredible, and Don got a great sound on it. Instantly, he tuned right in, and the lyrics are really brilliant, and Dave's delivery is brilliant, and it's got a really interesting solo on it. For some reason, out of anything I've ever cut, I still love listening to that, and a lot of it is the intro. Ed's guitar is amazing. Damn right it's amazing. You know, he raises a really good point. That sound is so sublime, I'd say crunchy. Didn't Eddie double his guitar solo with an electric sitar? Yeah, he doubled the solo, but that's it. That was actually Don's idea, I think. We worked so closely together. Bring us into the sessions for Van Halen's debut album, recorded at Sunset Sound. What was the process working in a studio with the band? First of all, we rehearsed them in the basement of Dave's house in Pasadena. I got along with the guys really well, and the brothers, Ed and Alex, used to come over to my house to hang out. And we also benefited from the fact that Don and I had worked together for so long, and Don had a fix on the guitar and had great communication with Ed, and that was amazing. He could look at Ed and know what Ed wanted. You can't find that very often. I think the Beatles were very lucky because their engineer, Jeff Emmerich, was someone who could communicate with them. he knew know what McCartney would want in terms of the sound of his bass. If I got an engineer like Don Landy, it gives me freedom to think about the lyrics and all that. 
Don could almost read Ed's mind. Did you cut the band live in the studio for that album? Dave would sing with the band, and then we would go back and patch up his vocal. So the band and him were all playing together. Whereas a lot of times, people laid down tracks, and then the singer would lay the vocal down. Dave was in the ISO booth, where I could see him and he could see me, and the band was out in the studio. Everybody had eye contact. I made sure that Al and Ed could see Dave in the ISO booth so they had eye contact like they were used to. So they were basically all playing live together. Wow, that is absolutely incredible, knowing what kind of music came out of that. And that is hard to do. That is hard to do. You need to know your songs inside out in order to do that, which obviously looks like they did. So they were basically all playing live together, as I said. Then it would go back and keep a lot of Dave's vocals, patch him up because he was singing with the band. It was basically like a live performance, especially on the first album. Holy, that is incredible, man. That is absolutely incredible. Man, I wonder how many overdubs Ed had to do. Or I, from memory, I don't think he did a lot. I think it was all just like one guitar track. Two at max if he had to do rhythm and solo, but that's unbelievable. And they were nailing final takes pretty quickly? Oh God, are you kidding? I think we did that record in less than two weeks. Less than two weeks for such a awesome classic album? Oh man, that is like blowing my mind. I can't believe it. We went in there and bang, 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 bang. They'd been playing those songs live and you know, I had an epiphany. The album was done and I went over to where they were playing live at the Pasadena Civic Auditorium and they were playing Ain't Talking About Love. Sorry, Ain't Talking About Love. The record wasn't even out and everybody in that place, there must have been about 2,000 people was singing along with the lyrics going, hey, 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 dance, 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 hey, 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 bam. It was like the Beatles at the Cavern. These guys were like stars in Pasadena. I knew right then, oh God, something is going on here. That must have been such an exciting time. Eruption is considered one of the greatest guitar souls of all time. Duh. Tell me about the origins of that. I was in this little room making phone calls next to the recording studio, and I walked in and N was sitting there kind of playing it. And I went, what's that? And he said, it's just something I warm up with before each show. And I said, Don, roll tape. And he said, I'm rolling. He heard it too, and he'd already pressed record. So it just went boom, and we got it, just like that. I never heard anything like that. I never heard that kind of tapping. I never heard anything that brilliant. And Ed said, no, it's nothing. He didn't even know. In addition to being a genius, Ed is one of the sweetest guys on the planet. Such a nice guy. He wasn't even going to show it to me. Oh my God. This article is just blowing me away right now. Can you imagine if Don or did not press record or if Ted did not walk in while Ed was doing that? I mean, we may have not have had eruption. Can you believe that? Oh, man. And the fact that it looks like, by the sounds of it, he did like in one take. That's just incredible. What a genius. You have such a high opinion of Eddie as a guitar player and have likened him to jazz greats like Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie. What is it about Eddie that warrants such comparisons? I will tell you exactly what it is. I think I first used a comparison to Art Tatum because if you listen to him, it's genius playing. And Charlie Parker, probably the hottest jazz player of all time. It's about speed accuracy and musical ability to go to the right notes and i thought for me it's art tatum charlie parker and this kid ed i don't care what anybody says i mean alan holdsworth could play really fast but he couldn't play those notes because ed plays melodically but plays brilliant stuff fast so for me those are the best musicians that i have ever heard and i'm a jazz player i play trumpet i play drums Listen to an Art Tatum track or Charlie Parker record and you will hear that those two guys play crazy fast and insane great stuff. And Ed was like the third guy and that is why I made those comparisons. Guitar player asks, Eddie doesn't get as much credit as he should as a brilliant rhythm guitar player. Do you agree? More so because it's not just rhythm guitar player. Without those riffs, there's nothing to write melodies to. So he came up with, and in parentheses it says, uh, Ted is actually sings a riff for Ain't Talking About Love. <laughs> If he hadn't written that riff, Dave couldn't have written Ain't Talking About Love. You can go on and on. Ed's riff were of a song, so Dave could hear the riff and he could come up with a melody to go with it. So, I mean, he was more than just a solo guitar player. He's a songwriter with Dave. And you can't minimize Dave's lyrical ability because without that, Van Halen wouldn't have had the sense of humor. Absolutely right. David Lee Roth, man. A beast of his own, I tell you. A beast of his own. Early on in the band's career, you perceived David Lee Roth as kind of the weakest link in terms of his singing ability. What did you do to help him achieve his potential as a singer? You know what? That's been overemphasized. It was one day. 
We went in there to do the demo, and there were certain notes that were a problem for him to hit. They were out of his range, but his melody was great, and I was a little nervous, that's all. But Dave had such a great lyrical ability and everything else. I just hung in there. I remember it was just one day that I said that, but after that, I just started talking to him more. Dave is a really, really good singer and a brilliant lyricist and a brilliant melody writer. So just because he couldn't hit certain notes, any producer would have been afraid. And the people that were looking at Van Halen before, like a and Records and Gene Simmons, Dave's voice scared them off. It wouldn't be Van Halen if there was somebody to sing perfectly on pitch. It's all fucked up, and that's what makes him Van Halen. Yeah, I think Van Halen is like the quintessential American party band, right? Like, that's what you think when you listen to Van Halen, just one big party. And Dave <laughs> has a huge part to do with that. And I think not only his look and his personality, but also the way he sings, right? It's not perfect. His lyrics are all over the place. His lyrics are funny. They're kind of sarcastic. They're always like half joking. A lot of the songs have this sexual innuendo in them, you know. That's all part of it, the whole party aura. And uh, man, they couldn't have picked a more perfect lead singer. You've said your favorite solo by Eddie is on You're No Good. Why is that? Because he emphasizes the lyrics. It's ugly. It's almost like revenge. It's sad and angry, emphasizes the lyrics, and gets the point across. Obviously, it isn't technically the best solo, and only Ed knew what his best solos are, but it works so well because it drives the point of the song home, and he's out there by himself. There's no rhythm guitar behind him. Wow, I gotta go back and listen to that. You're no good. Man, it's been a while since I heard that, but gotta definitely check that out. Hopefully you do too. Okay, back to the article. There is a certain sadness and revenge to it, and I know that sounds weird, But take a listen to the original Betty Everett record. You think, God damn, those bastards just ruined someone's life. I told those guys, I don't know if you know the original Betty Everett song, but the lyric is, I broke a heart that was gentle and true. I left a boy for someone like you. And so I told Ed, when the chorus hits, make your guitar playing like psycho, like you're stabbing somebody. I told Dave, scream like a psycho, like you're stabbing somebody. I want it to be like, let's kill this fucker who's no good. Let's get him. (laughs) Man, now I really need to listen to that solo. You know what I'm saying? With Eddie and Dave as songwriting collaborators, there was great creative dynamic, but there was friction too. How did that all play out? There was no friction with the first or second album because we put those together in Pasadena. Ed would have a riff and Dave would have a melody and a lyric and we would go from there. So they were writing and it was the four of them rehearsing. We were working up songs in the basement of Dave's home in Pasadena so everybody was relaxing. Ed would come up with a riff and Dave was fast on his feet and would come up with instant stuff and double entendres and great little funny things. Dance the Night Away was a change in a high watermark as a pop song. How many bands in the world can go out and play Ain't Talking About Love and Mean Streets and turn around and do Dance the Night Away? Like I said, it's like going from the Kinks to the Beach Boys. Guitar player asks, speaking of the Kinks, Van Halen covered Where Have All the Good Times Gone on Diver Down a record split between originals and cover songs by the likes of Roy Orbison, Martha, and the Vandellas. How did that record come about? We got trapped on that record because Dave wanted to make a video because of the popularity then of MTV. So we recorded Pretty Woman and then made a video of it. It was huge on MTV, so Warner Brothers said to us, listen, put out an album. And so the managers of my record company are saying, go in and make that record. But we didn't have the songs worked up. That's why we did Happy Trails and Dancing in the Streets. That was my idea. Ed had this melody on keyboard that I liked, and I said, we didn't have a melody for the song, so I said, let's use that for Dancing in the Street. For a long time, Ed was pissed off at me because he didn't want to do Dancing in the Streets. He wanted his song. I have some outtakes of the band doing Happy Trails, and it is so fucking funny because they start singing it, and Ed goes, come on, Ted, don't make us laugh. And I'm going, I can't help it, you guys. This is terrible. (laughs) And then they sing some more, and Ed goes, where's Ted? I didn't want him to see me laughing, so I was down on the floor where they couldn't see me. (laughs) He laughs. So there was a lot that went on in the making of that record that was fun. Some of the band didn't remember it that way, but honestly, those guys were a lot of fun. All of them. Oh, man, that just sounds like such a good time. You know, that whole era with the first album, especially the first album. But, you know, when you're young, innocent, you don't have fame yet, you don't have money yet. You're just having a good time. You're just having a blast. It's not about the money. It's just about the music and having fun with your friends. That's like the best times. You know, a lot of the times, the best albums are the first couple albums of every band, you know. That's probably a big reason why, you know. You know, money's not an issue. They don't care. They just want to have fun and and create really good music. And um, 
Yeah, it definitely came across. I mean, that first album is just so iconic. You know, I remember the first time looking at that vinyl and seeing those four gods on that vinyl with this with the lighting and the, you know, David Lee Ross hair blowing. These they look like gods, like rock gods literally on the vinyl as you're looking at this and listen to that music where you're like, how are they doing this, you know? Anyways, do yourself a favor, go check out Van Halen's first album. You've probably heard it a thousand times, but it won't hurt. Listen to it one more time and get inspired. I'll do the same. Thank you so much for listening to the end. Funny Fred Zed and I have a passion for rock. I hope it shows. All we want to do is just share this with the world. Speaking of sharing, please connect with me on Instagram, X, and TikTok at PJ Pat Loves Rock. You can connect with me on Facebook. Let's not forget Facebook at It's One Louder Podcast where you can see videos and all the shorts that I upload as well. And of course, YouTube, as you know, we're here. Thank you. We appreciate you. Rock on to live on. <laughs>